And uh, I'm 47 years old, I was 45 at the time, so strange pains appearing in my back is sort of normal. So I, I just, I didn't really think anything of it. It was, um, I thought I'd just done something, I don't know. And I love to be outdoors and surf and paddleboard and things like that. So I thought maybe I just overdid it. So I'll wait, I don't have to work out. That was a good excuse. So. A couple weeks go by, the pain is still there. I don't know what's going on. And I wait a few more weeks and a few more weeks, pain is still there. And then um, it's right kind of in the middle of COVID time. And in Florida, I don't know if you've heard, but we didn't really participate in COVID in Florida. Um, however, at the beginning, people really were like, what is this flu that's going around? But uh, I remember at one point, my wife and I were having a conversation, Chris and I were having a conversation, and she said, would, would you quit coughing all the time? We're in the middle of a global pandemic. And <laughs> I didn't realize it, but I was like, <clears throat> I go like that. And I had no idea. And then, then I started realizing the pain wasn't so much here, the pain was up here. And so I Googled, which you should never do, <laughs> right? The worst possible thing. I did what I tell everybody not to do. I Google back pain, chest pain, throat clearing, and it comes up heartburn and indigestion. I never had it. So I go to the grocery store, I buy some Tums. It doesn't work. I go back, I buy some like over the counter heartburn medicine. That doesn't do anything. So I go to the doctor and he's like, that stuff's junk. It doesn't work. You have to take 80 of those things. Here's a prescription. So I go and take the prescription. It doesn't do anything. So we go back to the doctor. They do, they do a scan, I, they put me to sleep. They do some scans and stuff like that. This is a Friday morning. Kristen and I get back to our house and in our house, in our kitchen, there's like our kitchen and then there's a little island and then our breakfast table and things like that. And so Kristen's kind of standing on the kitchen side and I'm standing on the other side and we're just talking and she's kind of making fun of me because I'm coming out of anesthesia. And uh, our phones are sitting there and we hadn't been home 30 minutes. And all of a sudden my phone rings and it's my doctor's phone number. And I'm sorry if you're a doctor, but you guys don't ever call any of us back, ever. And, and if you call us right back, I mean, we both looked at each other and went, uh-oh. Like it's lunchtime on Friday, like the doc should be on the golf course by this point, right? And so I pick it up and he says, hey, sorry to call so soon, but um, we found a mass. And I was like, and he said, oh, okay. He said, we've, you, we've found a, a mass in your neck and we need you to come in tomorrow morning. I'll be in the office at 6.30 or seven in the morning. And I said, tomorrow's Saturday. And he said, yeah, that's fine. We need you to come. And I said, hold on. I put it on speakerphone. I said, tell, tell us what's going on. He said, well, we found a mass. And so we go in, we go through more tests. What ends up happening is through months and months and months of all sorts of different tests, they find out that I have two cancerous tumors in my neck that are about the size of my fingers. And they're growing from the front of my neck around across my vocal nerve, which is why I was coughing and clearing my throat. Cause it's just like somebody was putting their finger on my vocal nerve all the time. And then it was growing back to my spine. So it was pushing on all the nerves on my spine. So that's why I was having all these weird phantom pain. Like it was pressing here and hurting here, that sort of thing. And that, that first phone call, or actually from the first time I like went to the grocery store until I ended up having surgery and having treatment for cancer, it, it was suffering. It wasn't the biggest suffering in the world. And, and it still is going on. I, there's other things that are still happening. It's still there and all that, but by God's grace, I feel great and it's wonderful and it's fine. But I mean, it was emotional suffering. It was relational. I mean, it squeezed friendships and work relationships and family. And we're trying to manage my parents in the middle of all this and our kids and all that sort of stuff. It was physically suffering. I had surgery and all these things. And I think I'm a Superman. So I thought I could have surgery on Monday and be you know, back by Wednesday and ready to go. And it doesn't work like that when you're 47 years old. And, but, Here's the thing, Jesus makes some promises in the Bible. 
and he makes some astounding promises. Like he said in Matthew 28, I will never leave, I will be with you always. How about that? Or I will never lose one that's my own. Think about that promise. Or Jesus says this, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Ne like never, that's, I mean, that's an astounding promise. Or Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I mean, think about some of those, pro those are really astounding promises. Now, I don't know whether you believe those promises are true or not, but there is a promise of Jesus that you don't have to be a Christian. You don't ever have to have read the Bible. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. But as soon as I tell you this promise of Jesus, you will 100% know it is true. And Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. Like you, you will have pain. You will, a part of living in this life is a hundred percent guarantee that you will have trouble. And so I'm, I'm just wondering how many, we did this kind of individually and we don't, we're not gonna tell stories, but how many of you have been through some version of suffering? Okay, the rest of you are liars <laughs> or you're just so young, it just hasn't come yet. It's like, give it a second. How about that for some good news? But if you think about this, suffering and God is one of the most profound things you can think about in life, right? How does that work? How is God good? How is he loving? How is he sovereign? How is he in control? How is he all the God things? And yet there's suffering in the world. I mean, every single one of us had to at some level have had that thought enter our mind or had somebody come to us and say, okay, so you believe in God. How do you reconcile suffering and a good God, right? And here's what happens when we're in suffering. We have some go-to moves to kind of cope with our suffering, don't we? I mean, some of it is, we're just gonna deny it, right? You walk in here and somebody says, how are you doing? You're like, blessed and highly favored. And it's like, no, you're not. Your marriage is falling apart. Or the other one is we'll, we'll just minimize it, right? Like I told you, I have cancer. And when, then when I say, how many of you are suffering? You're like, oh, cancer, I can't raise my hand. And we compare it and we minimize our thing, but it's still suffering. But that's sort of a coping mechanism to deal with that thing. Or we'll just muscle through it, right? You just white knuckle it. You're like, I'll just, I'm just bear down, grip my teeth, and I'll get, like, we'll just, mm, we'll get through it. Some of us love to do it that way. Or we'll self-medicate to deal with it. I mean, everything from like, I'm gonna drink my suffering away to I'm gonna binge the next best Netflix show. Nothing wrong with binging a Netflix show. I've watched three seasons of a show on this trip alone, <laughs> sitting on airplanes. <laughs> but when we try to somehow deal with suffering in our life with Netflix, come on, let's just be honest. Or we'll just shop it away, a little shopping therapy. That'll make it, yeah, okay. <laughs> or we'll drown it out in our busyness We'll just, I mean, how busy can I get at work? How many sports can I put my kids into? How many activities? If we're really not careful, we can find ourselves even doing really good things like serving at church and doing all things like that. Meanwhile, all we're trying to do is cope with our suffering. And all of those things are like taking a beach ball. I live at the beach. And you get to take one of those big kind of rainbow colored beach balls and you go out in a pool or in the ocean and you shove it down. Have you ever done that? You like, you as a little kid, you get the beach ball and you see how long you can hold it underwater. And you can do it for a minute, can't you? But you can't hold that thing underwater for long. Eventually it's coming back up. And the harder you shove it down and the harder you push it down, it doesn't just kind of like come wafting back up to the surface, right? Do you ever play the game where you guys would like get in a circle 
Maybe it's just me and my friends that didn't like each other. We'd get in a circle and you'd push it down and then see who would get it in the face. That's what happens in our suffering. You shove it down long enough, eventually it just comes erupting back up on you. And the problem is it comes back up on everybody else as well. And here's what, here's what I found in the midst of my suffering was you, you can Google, give me ways to cope with suffering and it will give you thousands of tips and tricks and good advice on how to cope with your suffering. But none of those things ever actually deal with suffering. And all of those things are not necessarily good advice in the middle of our suffering. People would come to me and they'd be like, have you taken these vitamins? Have you seen this doctor? Here's the name of my doctor. How, do you exercise? How's your eating? What are you doing? And I'm thinking in the middle of my suffering, all you're doing, I know you're trying to be nice, but all you're doing is heaping more weight on top of me that is actually just increasing the amount of suffering. Because now not only am I suffering with whatever I'm suffering with, I can't do the things you're telling me will help me fix my suffering. And so now I'm suffering about not being able to do the things to fix my suffering. And so what I wanna do today is I wanna walk through John chapter 11. So if you got a Bible, go to John chapter 11. I'm gonna be in the English standard version. But what I think we need, my goal this morning is not to give you more good advice in the middle of suffering. I just wanna give you some good news in the middle of your suffering. I want us to answer, ask and answer the question, Jesus, you have to be doing more than just my suffering. So Jesus, what more are you doing in my suffering? Right, you've been, you've been in this more series. This is a year of more. And for most of us, what we think more is or abundant or exceedingly more than I can ever hope, dream or imagine is always up and to the right. Church grows in more numbers. My business goes up in sales. My family gets happier, more people get. But what happens when more is not just bigger and better, but it's the full spectrum of life. And what if, what, what if you encounter the promise and Jesus is doing more in your suffering and then he wants to do even more, exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever hope, dream, or imagine, but the only way to get you there is to do this end of more, not this end of more. And I think we have to deal with this end of the more. And so the question we're gonna ask is, I mean, a lot of us will do it, sort of breaking the third commandment, like, Jesus, what are you doing? And I wanna turn around and go, Jesus, what are you doing? What more are you doing? Because there has to be more than just this act of suffering. So with that big, long run, here we go. Listen fast, we're doing the whole chapter. Verse one, John 11, verse one. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with oil, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Verse three, so the sister sent to him, sent to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Do you, do you see those two things? In verse three, Jesus, he whom you love is suffering. I mean, just right there in, they're just separated by one word. And I think most often we think God's love and suffering are mutually exclusive to one another. But what, what, what you need to hear is that suffering and Jesus's love for you are not mutually exclusive. They can exist in the exact same space at the exact same time. And so Jesus, what, are you, what more are you doing in my suffering? The answer is Jesus is endlessly loving us in our suffering. He's loving you even more than you realize in your suffering. Jeremiah 31.3 says this, I have loved you with an everlasting love. 1 John 4.8 says, God is love. And Hebrews 13, eight says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
So think about that. I have loved you with an everlasting love, meaning past, present, and future. My love is an eternal everlasting love. My character, God says, is love. My character in nature, independent of anything that happens, is love. And that Jesus never changes, which is really good news because when our circumstances fall off the cliff, and we enter into suffering, that has absolutely nothing to do with God's everlasting love, his character and nature, or his promise to never change towards you. God is endlessly loving us in our suffering. So our our son, Gavin, and I said we had two kids. Our kids are a little bit older now. We have one that's in university, just turned 20 the other day. I cried about five times in one day. He was a little, little guy and he had bunk beds. He actually slept, he had bunk beds that were my bunk beds when I grew up. Um, yeah, oh, that's super sweet. Um, so he, he slept on the bottom bunk bed and we had the rule, you didn't go up on the top bunk bed. So he goes to bed, we go to bed and it's about two in the morning and all of a sudden we hear this giant like, you know that like thud on the ground. And all of a sudden there is a blood curdling scream. He's probably about four years old. And you know, like parents, you know, there's the scream that's like, I'm not really hurt. I just want you to come and pay attention to me. And you're like, "Mm -hmm, no, it's three in the morning, deal with that. (laughs) And then there's the like, "Uh uh-oh, something has gone terribly wrong. We wake up to that. I go running down the hallway, I go into his bedroom and he's, he's like getting up off the floor and his arm isn't like this. His arm is going like this in places it shouldn't. He had, in the middle of the night, had crawled up on his top bunk because he decided he wanted to sleep on the top bunk and he had rolled out of his bunk bed in the middle of the night. Imagine waking up to that. Now, I can see so much judgment on your faces right now. (laughs) I know what you're thinking because you're thinking, come on, Adam, where were the bunk bed rails? That's what you were thinking, right? We have bunk bed rails. They were in the closet. So the moral story is, it's not enough to own them. You have to actually use them. But that's a whole other like sermon in James. But, but do you think at that moment, his suffering changed any of the way I felt towards him? Do you think it caused me to love him any less because he had made dumb decisions and it was out of his control, whatever it was. No, if anything at that moment, everything in me as his father welled up and I just wanted to grab him, pick him up, run him to the hospital, do whatever I could do. We sat in the hospital ER and ate popsicles. Like everything in me loved it. And because of his suffering, it it had no impact on the love I had for him. Do you know how you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your circumstances is not a reflection of how God feels about you? The cross of Jesus Christ. The cross tells you exactly how God feels about you. And it actually tells you how he feels about you in and through suffering, his own suffering. And so your circumstances, my circumstances, don't dictate to us how God feels about us. The cross of Jesus Christ does. The fact that God would send his son to die on our behalf while we suffered in our own sin tells us how God loves us. So it goes on. But when Jesus, verse four, but when Jesus heard it, that he was sick, he said to him, this illness does not lead to death. That's a bold promise. That, I mean, because spoiler alert, what happens to Lazarus? He dies. And then he gets up again. Jesus raises him from the dead. Sorry to ruin the end of the story. That's where it's going. But they don't know that in the middle of it. But here's the thing. Jesus, what more are you doing in the middle of my suffering is that Jesus is faithfully keeping all of his promises in the middle of our suffering. 
all of God's promises are yes. Second Corinthians 1 10 says all of God's promises are yes in Jesus Christ. Every single one of them. And I remember when I was going through a bunch of my cancer treatment, people would come and they would have these like really like hallmark, like greeting card, Christianese sentimentality for me. Everything's gonna be okay. It'll be all right, you know. And those were true. It just seemed like people wanted to either deny my suffering or run to the promises of Jesus. They didn't have a whole lot of capacity to say your suffering and Jesus's promises are at the same time. And what you and I need in the middle of our suffering is not a denial of our suffering and all of God's promises or a denial of Jesus's promises and then just a fixation on our suffering. What we need is we need both of those things, don't we? Don't we need people to go, I get it, it hurts. And Jesus is keeping all of his promises. Now, if the cross tells you that your circumstance doesn't get to dictate God's love towards you, what, what tells you that God is keeping every one of his promises? Because I, it looks like in the middle of suffering, God isn't keeping his promises. And the reason that you can know that God is always keeping his promises is because of the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection is God's vindication. It's like his stamp and seal that says, I know it looks like it was gonna end really, really, really bad, but I overcame that thing and I can overcome anything. And since I beat death, you can bank everything on my promises. They're all good. (laughs) They're all good. And I don't know about you, but it is so comforting for all the complexities of God being sovereign and in control in my suffering. I would much rather go through it with God completely in control than to go with it, go through it with God being out of control. So he goes on and he says, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. I don't know what is in your translation. My translation, translation, it says this, it is for, you should circle that little word in your Bible, for it, the suffering, the illness, the death, all that stuff, it is for, it's going towards the glory of God so that, so that the reason for the suffering as it's heading towards the glory of God is that so the son of God may be glorified through it. The the glory of God is the weightiness. It's like the fullness of all of it. You take all the attributes of God, his being all loving, his all powerful, his all knowing, his all merciful, his all kind, his all just. You take all those things and you, you stack them all up and the glory of God is like the weight of that thing. So the question is, Jesus, what more are you doing in my suffering? It's that Jesus is ultimately revealing God's glory in and through your suffering. It's for the glory of God. John says in the, uh, Jesus says in the high priestly prayer in John 17, one, he says, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son that you may be glorified. The hour he's talking about is his suffering. Jesus's prayer is not just, not just saving work. That would be awesome. But he picks his eyes up even more than that. And he goes, God, Father, would you use this, in, this seemingly insurmountable suffering? Would you use it so that you would have a spotlight shined on you as the most glorious one there is? Suffering is not pointless. It's not pointless. You you can just look at the cross and know that suffering has a point and a reason to it. I mean, there's, there's nothing greater than the glory of God. So wouldn't you want 
your suffering to have a point that God would be glorified? Jesus is saying, in the middle of your suffering, the thing I'm doing more of is I'm pointing to the greatest thing in the world. Meaning what you're going through isn't pointless. It isn't random. It isn't happenstance. In and through this thing, God is pointing it to the greatest thing, using it for the greatest good, which is the worship and the glory and the magnification of the Lord. So he goes on in verse five and he says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. There it is again. So that when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. How about that for love? Then after he had said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? And Jesus answered, and we're not even gonna dig into this. This is a bizarre answer. He says, well, they're not 12 hours in the day. Like, what? If anyone walks in the day and does, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant that he was taking rest in sleep. It's like Jesus, Jesus says, it's fine. Everything's be all right. He's not really dead. He's just asleep. And they're like, well, if he's asleep, won't he wake up? And Jesus is just like, oh my gosh, you guys are the worst. <laughs> How many years have we been together? I mean, which should be super encouraging to us, right? Yeah. Like if you find Jesus a little bit hard to understand, you actually can still be a great disciple and follow after him because you'll be, you're just biblical if you don't get it. <laughs> then Jesus told them plainly, he's like, read my lips. Okay. Look at me, fellas, right here. Heads up, look me in the eyes, okay? Let me explain it. Lazarus has died. And then here it is. For your sake, I'm glad that I was not there. So that you may believe, but let us go to him. That, that little phrase, for your sake, literally means for your good. That's what that means. And so what he's saying is all of this is happening not just for God's glory, it's going there. It's got the final end destination and point, but it's also for your good. And so Jesus, what more are you doing in my suffering? It's that Jesus is graciously working for our good in our suffering. He really is working for our sake, for our good. We love some Romans 8.28, don't we? We know that in all things, for those who love the Lord, called according to his promises, that God's working for their good. We love to quote it when it's on the good more end of the spectrum. It's just as true on the suffering more end of the spectrum. He's working for our good. And no matter where suffering comes from, right? Because listen, suffering can come from me like I can make, I can just make some dumb decisions and suffer. Anybody want, I, if, you know, can't say amen, say ouch for that one. <laughs> and sometimes I suffer because you do something stupid. I'm just the collateral. Day. Have you, you've had that happen, right? In a relationship, somebody does something and you're like, okay, so now I'm left holding the bag for your bad decisions and suffering. Sometimes there's suffering in the world because the world is just a busted, broken, it's, the, it's just, it ripples throughout creation now. Cells multiply at rates they're not supposed to multiply at. And sometimes we suffer because there is an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And sometimes we suffer because God is working for our good. But no matter what is going on, I mean, you read Pastor One, 1 Peter 5, 10, he says, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, 
the God of all grace. Meaning he's not just a God of a little bit of grace. And he's not just a God of sometimes grace. I remember when, when our kids were really little, Gavin was playing, he was playing matchbox cars, you know, or trains or whatever he was doing kind of in our living room on this little table. And I came home, I'd been out at the store and I'd found this dress. It had all these different colors in it. It was this beautiful little dress. And Sophie was like three years old, I guess, at the time. So I come home and I have this in a box, in a bag, and I walk in and they're all in, and I give it to Sophie. And I'm like, Sophie, I bought you a present. It just, it was a random Tuesday afternoon. So I put the gift down, she unwraps it. She like pulls it out and she, you know, does what a little girl does, which is like rips off her other dress and puts this dress on. She's twirling around and I love it, dad. You know, all this sort of stuff. I'm feeling like I just hit a home run out of the park as a dad. And I look over and Gavin is like glaring at me. <laughs> and he, and he, he looks at me and he goes, that's not fair. To which parents, the minute one of your kids says that's not fair, you're just like, I wish you hadn't said that. <laughs> and I just, I looked at him and I go, all right, bud, you want me to go buy you a dress too? Let's go, let's get in the car. And he was like, nah, that's cool, dad. That's all right. We, you, we don't want fair. You understand that, right? Fair is getting what you deserve. What we want is a God of all grace. And, and Hebrews 12 tells us, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. That, that the Lord isn't punishing you as a follower of Jesus with suffering. Let me say that again. Be, I can stand up here and 100% tell you knowing absolutely nothing about you, about your circumstances, who you are, what is going on. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your suffering is not punishment from the Lord. It's not. And I know what you're thinking is, yeah, but you don't know what I did. I'm not saying there aren't consequences, but, the, but God is not punishing you. It isn't like I sinned and then he smote me with cancer. And the reason that I can stand up here knowing nothing about you, knowing none of your story, knowing every single one of you are suffering and say as a follower of Jesus, he is not punishing you is because on the cross, Jesus bore all of your punishment. Yeah. Yeah. So and either he bore it all or he didn't. Yeah. Come on. Come on. And scripture tells us that he bore all all of our sin, all of the punishment was poured out on him that he suffered in our place. He died the death we deserve to die. He paid the price. If, the, if there was gonna be punishment for sin, Jesus bore the punishment and paid the total complete price. And he was actually the only one that could ever say, I don't deserve to have punishment poured out on me for my sins. I'm the only one that doesn't deserve to suffer. And yet he steps into our life, lives exactly the lives we live, except he doesn't live it with sin. Therefore, when he goes to the cross, he has nothing to be punished for. And then it pours out on him. He who knew no sin became, think about that, became sin that we might be the righteousness of God. Meaning when you suffer, it is not God punishing you. As a follower of Jesus, he is working for your good. Mold you, shape you. The word discipline means to disciple, means to conform and shape. And so he's conforming and shaping you, molding you to make you look a little bit more like Jesus. And the thing I had to wrestle with in the middle of my suffering was, okay, if it's not pointless and it's for your glory and it's disciplining me, okay, Lord, what is it in me that doesn't look like Jesus that it's just gonna take cancer to get my attention and you go, eyes up here, look at me. And at that point I had to go, all right, let's do it. Because the last thing I wanna do is waste the pain. So 
In verse 16, four days pass, Lazarus dies, Jesus comes to Bethany, the sisters, Mary and Martha, I mean, they're hurting, they're mourning, they're grieving. They're probably really angry at Jesus because he just said it's better that I don't show up for a while. They don't get it. They're confused, all this sort of stuff. And then they both say the exact same thing. If you look in verse 21 and verse 30, 32, they say the exact same thing. They say, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And what does Jesus do at that moment? Listen, if, if I were Jesus, thank God I'm not. But if I were like, if, if they came to me and were like, if you had been here, this wouldn't have ended up this way. You know what I would have done? Fine, go ahead, take care of it. Thanks for talking to me that way. I don't need this. I'll go somewhere else where people are nice to me. But that's not what he does. Look what he, in verse 23, he goes to Martha and says, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Martha, Martha wanted to have a theological discussion with Jesus. And Jesus doesn't go, nope. You mouth off at me, forget. No, what he does is he goes, he goes, okay. If delving into the depths of life and death and me being life and death and resurrection, if that's what's gonna comfort you, okay, let's do that. And then he walks over to Mary. And what does he do with Mary? It's the shortest verse in all the Bible. Verse 35, Jesus weeps with her. And so he's meeting, he's meeting Martha in the place where she needs to be met in the middle of her suffering. And then she walks over to Mary and meets Mary right where she needs to be met. He just gets emotional and cries and weeps. And he didn't go all into theological discussions. And so what more, Jesus, are you doing in the middle of my suffering is that Jesus is compassionately comforting us in the middle of our suffering. He's always comforting us. We have a high priest who is not unable to sympathize with us. It says that when Jesus had compassion on them, the little, the little Greek word there, it's different than a lot of other places. A lot of other places where you hear the word compassion, it's like splagizomai, it means like from the guts. This is a completely different word, imbromomenos. Here's what it means, doesn't even matter what it is, can't even hardly say it. But it, it, it's this combination of being mad and sad at the same time. It's as if Jesus is sad, like his compassion is coming from a place where he's sad that Lazarus has died and a place where he's actually angry at death. And so it doesn't move him to resignation, it moves him to break his heart and to say, I hate that death is ruling and reigning in this time. And so, so I hate that death rules and reigns so much. Let's talk about my resurrection. Because I'm going to deal with the ruling of death. I'm going to conquer that. And I'm so sad over so suffering. I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to weep with you. So in verse 38, it says, then Jesus deeply moved again. There it is. He came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Now, if you have been in church on Easter, little like lights should start flashing. John's like throwing out little signs. Jesus said to him, take the stone away. Martha, the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time, there'll be an odor. For he's been in dead for four days. He's like... All right, back up everybody, it's gonna stink a minute. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, 
come out. And the man who had died came out. Now watch this, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I don't know about you, but if you've ever read that story before, here's what goes on in my mind when I picture that. Jesus rolls up, there's the tomb, and he goes, get the stone away, Lazarus, come on. And then Lazarus, it's like Lazarus comes out of this tomb and he's like, <laughs> like, what's up? I'm alive. That's not what it says. What it says is that his hands and feet are bound. He's got a cloth wrapped around him, right? He's got, he's like mummified. He's got death rags. He's got all wrapped up on him. And it's like, like you just, I mean, there's a little bit of comedy in it, but he just, I mean, he just comes hopping out. And then Jesus doesn't turn to Lazarus and go, all right, man, unwind all this mess you've been in. He turns and looks at them and he says, you unbind this guy. So Jesus, what more are you doing in my suffering is that Jesus is giving us a community to walk us into a newness of life and through suffering. And don't, and listen, so many of us when suffering hits, what we do is the exact opposite of this. We hit the eject button, we go and run because somewhere, somewhere along the way, somebody preaching a prosperity gospel, which isn't prosperity and it isn't gospel, it's just a lie from the pit of hell, told us that if things aren't going well, you should feel a bunch of shame and you should go and run and hide until the thing you feel shame about is done and then you can come back. But Jesus says the exact opposite. When you're in the middle of your suffering, the very thing I'm doing is putting up a community around you, a fellowship, Beautiful. see your name around you. And the thing to do is to run into that in the middle of your suffering. If you don't run into it, you will miss what Jesus is doing in your suffering. I, I broke my arm dirt biking in a dirt bike race accident. And I remember I, we were all summer afternoon, we were all at the top of our hill, we had our dirt bikes, I was about 12 years old. We were racing down this hill. So ready, set, go. And all my friends, you know, and we take off down the hill. We come racing down the hill and my yard is kind of right here. We all come down, all my friends start to like turn their dirt bikes. And in my mind, I thought, you know what, in school they told me the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm going straight. The only problem is I didn't calculate the little curb at the end. And I hit that thing and I just Superman over the handlebars. And I go flying and, and boom, pop, pop, pops out. My mom goes running inside. She grabs a cooking sheet, like a baking sheet. She grabs a Southern Living magazine and duct tape and duct tapes my broken arm inside of Southern Living to this cookie sheet. It's like, it, I can't even explain to you how redneck we are like, that's, that's how we solve like compound fracture problems in the South. Now, how silly would it have been for me at that moment when my mom's like, okay, you broke your arm. Let's go to the hospital. And I was like, nah, no, 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 no. Hey mom, why don't we see how this thing heals up? And then when it gets a little better, then let's go to the hospital and then let's tell the doctors what did happen once and how things have healed up, but they're all better now and I don't really need them. You would be like, no, you're an idiot. Don't do that. The hospital was designed for when you were busted and broken for you to show up and for all the other healthy people to rally around you and love and care for you. And so if you're busted and broken, get in the middle of this thing. And if you're healthy, guess who you are? You're a doctor. You're a medic, you're part of the rescue team. I remember after I had surgery that what happened was because they had done work on my vocal nerves, I couldn't sing. I was standing in church. I was like sitting right here in church. I was actually kind of like right over there. And they started to play and I went to sing. And it was like, Ugh! and nothing came out. I could talk, but for some reason, and I'm a terrible singer anyway, I'm awful, but I love it. And at that instant, I remember I, I turned and looked at our congregation and the thought that came into my mind and the prayer that came into my heart was, Lord, would you take all of their worship 
and just count it as mine for a while? Because I can't, I can't do it. We need to be carried by the community because that's what more Jesus is doing. And then finally, it's this. You know, this whole story is not at all about Lazarus. It's not. We make this thing all about him. This whole thing was pointing to something greater. And what it's pointing more to is Jesus. It's pointing that Jesus is our ultimate hope, our living hope that we just sang about. And he is our complete and total healing. First Peter 5, 10 says this, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory will himself Restore, establish, confirm, and strengthen. To him be dominion forever and ever. That as a follower of Jesus, one day you will walk into heaven. And Revelation says there will be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain. All the old things will have passed away. And Jesus himself, it says Jesus himself will wipe away your tears. Think about that. You come, you just come stumbling in busted, broken, having suffered in life. And Jesus goes, come here, it's all gone, it's done. And he just wipes your tears away. And he's like, no more suffering. So the invitation to us today is, if you are not a follower of Jesus, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus that is at work in our suffering, doing far more than we could ever hope, dream, or imagine. And come to Jesus so that you know that your suffering isn't punishment apart from Jesus. You're on your own. <laughs> Let him bear the punishment. Let him bear the pain. Let the promises be true and have everlasting healing in Jesus. And if you're walking with somebody who's suffering, man, I hope you'll go to them, make them a casserole, show up at the door, give them the meal. And then maybe you just grab one of these two things, put away the good advice and just say, you do know that Jesus loves you right now, don't you? You do know that he hasn't abandoned you right now. You do know that he's working, right? And, and just sling some good news on him. And as the band comes up, here's what I want us to do. I want us to respond. There's stations here, over here, there's prayer cards, there's one in the back. And as we sing and as we worship, what, what I would love for us to do is if you're going through something big or small, would you come to Jesus? And let him love you and care for you and comfort you and work good in you and assure you of his promises. Or if you know somebody who's suffering, would you come and put them before Jesus? And if you haven't come to Jesus, if you feel like you're out there on your own, would you come and, and give your life to Jesus and know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you that you are doing abundantly, exceedingly more than we could ever hope, dream, or imagine. So Lord, I pray that the good news of your gospel would seep deep into our souls in the middle of our suffering. And you would use it in our life, in our friends' lives, in this community's life, and to the ends of the earth. Lord, we want to be agents of comfort and healing. Lord, we love you and we respond and we worship to you now. Amen.